Okay, yeah, so everyone, so let's uh, yeah, get started. We, another, we have another uh, hour, and uh, then we will be done. And uh, so uh, I'm looking forward to it. So if you're looking at uh, that, uh, for example, that, uh, the what is the reaction rate if you consider that uh, a, a, a molecular is vibrational? For example, if the A reaction with a molecular BC, that can exchange that the, uh, the atoms from A, B, and C. So what if that the question is, what if that the, uh, a, uh, the, uh, this molecular has a vibrational energy? And uh, so then how do we calculate the reaction rate? The simple way is that, OK, in that the reaction rate, you just a, uh, using that the, uh, you reduce that the uh, vibrational energy in the activation energy. That's a simple way. But that is not really that the, uh, uh, the, uh, the, the process is happening. So therefore, that uh, in this uh, reaction rate, it's still a new law, but that instead of minus that the vi directly the vibrational energy, and then you, and the empirical parameter alpha is introduced. That means that uh, that alpha is one. That means that energy is just directly subtracting. Your alpha equals zero means that the uh, vibrational energy does not participate in that reaction. So that is a form a, a call a uh, Alex Friedman in Drexel University, uh, much weight. He was at Princeton right now in Purdue. They form an empirical model called alpha model. So the alpha model is try to affect that what is that the magnitude of alpha between zero and one. So what is the formulation basically saying that okay, so the activation energy change is due to that the uh, proportional to that the vibrational excitation energy here, and then multiply it by a factor. This factor, a f, and uh, is depend on that the activation, activated, the height of activated energy one of initial reaction, and the, that the afterward reaction a, uh, energy. So the difference between these two is actually that the uh, reaction heat release rate. So therefore, that uh, introduce that the ratio is proportional to the activation energy height of E1. It's a forward reaction and a backward reaction. And then introducing some constant gamma 1 and gamma 2. So if that the, the uh, gamma 1, assume the gamma 1 and the gamma 2, they are almost equal, and then the alpha is just the ratio of this a forward reaction activation energy and a backward reaction activating energy. So therefore, if that the backward activation energy EA2 is zero, that means alpha equal one. That means that if this process is endothermic reaction, then that reaction is a favorite. And if that reaction is exothermic, and then the alpha equals zero. So have you heard this kind of thing for, for a vibrational excited molecular? You add in more energy into it, and then the reaction rate, reaction is more favored if the process is endothermic. Is the reaction is less favored if the reaction is exothermic. Where did you learn this thing? Have you learned anything in, 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 in any kind of thermodynamics? What that equation called? Van der Hoef equation? So for endothermic reaction, if you add in reaction, the reaction move forward. If there's exothermic reaction, if you're adding heat, the reaction move backward. That is a, a, uh, a chemical equilibrium, shifting equilibrium, right? This actually, this thing is this, is the same idea as that chemical equilibrium, right? So, okay. So, and then the second, what is that the four diatomic molecules? If you want to estimate the reaction rate, let's say I have a vibrational molecules and collided with third body, and that energy is transferred to a third body, and then vibrational level reduced by one. So this for diatomic molecules, the reaction rate for that from the first level of zero and one, you can proportional to the number of n and m, and this is all empirical numbers, and active energy barriers. So this in the uh, tables and uh, are listed here. They try to fit that the, uh, a, the constant and make you do the computation. I think that this is the most of the practical way 
and people are doing this kind of uh, a vibrational transitional uh, relaxation. At a high level, the probability of relaxation is higher is multiplied by the number of uh, vibrational states. And uh, that is pretty much a, uh, a from a derived from quantum chemistry. So if you for a non-diatomic molecule like a methane and CO2, and then you have to be more complicated and introduce this kind of a, a scaling factor a, in addition to the, uh, to the, uh, to the uh, F a, uh, gamma. So all these things is tabulated in all literatures. If we really want to look, making a plasma code for methane and CO2 reforming or for combustion, you really care about that, the vibrational mode. For reforming, yes. For combustion, I think you don't, you don't have to uh, consider this as the first priority, okay? That makes most of you happy. But for reforming guys, and you need to consider because vibrational excitation is the key for reforming. You do not want to radical production for reforming. That is really not economically favorable. And uh, so after you understand all the reaction process, after you understand how to calculate that the reaction rate, and the no is that uh, we need to do a modeling, zero-dimensional modeling, one-dimensional modeling, or two-dimensional modeling, so that you can compare with the experimental data. But the, really the challenge is that this plasma simulate assisted combustion is a multi-physical process. You have uh, photons involving electrons, elect electronic and vibrational excitations, and this is m much, much more complicated than the combustion process. And then you have a uh, electromagnetic field if, because that is discharge. You can probably have acoustic waves because the discharge time scale is so short. The heat release time is so short, and right away drive your shockwave formation. And then you may have a, uh, a ignition and a combustion process as well. And another thing that is the multi-length scale. For example, the sheets near the electrode, they are sub-micron, right? How can you model something with sub-micron? If you try to model it, and that process is not a continuum model anymore, you cannot use the Navier-Stokes equation to do so. So how to model the shifts is really a headache for people and in plasma modeling field, OK? And then you have a, uh, a diffusion reaction zone, like a combustion. And you still have a far field, because the electromagnetic field, it can propagate the far field, not just combustion. Combustion, you need a flow to do it. Electromagnetic field can go to far field effect. You need to know uh, the, uh, the, uh, to solve it. And the multi-time scale, plasma, the time scale is very short, from a, a fraction of nanosecond, probably 200 nanosecond, and the plasma pretty much done. And then following, you have a combustion and reactive flow, and probably for you, the picosecond level to a, a millisecond level problem. Multi-species, and many of the reactions is very stiff. The time scale is very short, and then it's very steep problem. It's really challenging. It's a multidimensional and it'll be a final equilibrium. So this all these things is a challenge things. That's why that is many of the phys people, physics people, they, 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 they like this problem. And for mechanical engineers, you just look at the problem, it becomes complicated. But fortunately, there are many software are developed by this uh, physicist. And then you can use it and they coupling with your engineering solver and do something you could. So there are two different types of uh, plasma modeling. The one is that kinetic modeling. You want to do everything based on that the uh, a kinetic theory. And for example, you solve the distribution function using the Bosick equation, uh, we said it before. And using the Bosick equation, you get the reaction rate and uh, from the cross-section area. And then you using the kinetic equation and uh, you use, plug in all this kind of collisional energy transfer from vibrational to uh, really transitional. You can do this. But this, you only can do zero-dimensional or one-dimensional. If you want to do two-dimensional above, that computational cost is huge to do that. And uh, for multi-dimensional problem, and people doing using multi-fluid distribution, it's just the same Navier-Stokes equation, but adding a source term in terms of uh, the reaction. You're using the same fluid conservation equations, and you input the transfer properties and rate coefficient and uh, feeding as a E over N. You give me E over N, I give you a rate constant, or you can table looking. So that dramatically saves the time. And uh, the energy mode, electron, vibrational, you solve three different energy modes. 
and then coupling the neutral and the charged particles. So this is solve everything like fluid mechanics and you introduce in different source terms and then solving three energy equations, that's it. So that makes you to do a multi-dimensional. I show you one example of this uh, type of simulation. I show you to spend more time to introduce you how to model this. Because that uh, for us, many of us, and we really understand what is the physical process, right? Unless you go to engineering application and you go to this, this way. And uh, so in modeling that uh, in order to solve distribution function of electron energy, this is at a, a, a Boltzmann equation, and this is at the uh, a collisional a, a transfer, and uh, this is at the uh, Coulomb forces, considering that the uh, effect of the, and this is uh, basically that the, uh, the uh, rate change and uh, due to collision, and uh, this is due to collisional process. To solve this a, a, a Boltzmann equation, anybody who learned that the uh, a non-equilibrium non gas dynamics is not <coughs> only at a very simple conditions you can solve this Boltzmann equation. In most of the case, is is not, and uh, you have to do some kind of uh, a approximation. So one of the uh, approximations assume that the uh, this is a steady state problem, that the, the, the distribution function, the, the the process redistributing itself is so fast, okay. It doesn't depend on the time. And the second is that uh, you assume that uh, this is that uh, within the mean free pass, it is the elastic process. OK? So therefore, and, and, the se and second, that uh, you introduce a two-term uh, expansion. Expansion, this is a, a, a isotropic part. And this one is uh, dependent on the collision angle introducing a theta. So introducing this to a uh, expansion, and the second one is much smaller than the first one. And you can simplify this a uh, Boltzmann equation. You can solve it. That's a solver called Bosic plus. And uh, I'll try to show you where is the, the a, uh, Bosic plus. The Bosic plus can be downloaded. You can Google it, Google Bosic plus. You can find it and, uh, and download it. That can solve this equation give you the distribution function of electron energy, F. Once you know the F, and you know the cross-section area, you find the reaction rate, integration, right? That's easy. And there's a ZD plus gain software developed in France, and they couple this a, uh, Bosque solver, and they integrate it with a uh, DVODE solver, which is in the chemical uh, package, and they put this together, and then they, uh, they try to solve a, uh, a uh, zero-dimensional uh, plasma process. I think this is very useful. For the first thing, if you don't understand, you can use in ZD plus gain and uh, put a kinetic model into it to see what is going on in the process. I try to uh, show you, a, 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 see this is at the website, you can download for the uh, Bosic plus and the solver. So we downloaded it for a few years ago. We try to lay at a, a, a we try to, com a, because this is ZD plus gain, it's very difficult to use. If you change one reaction rate, one species, you have to revise all the uh, reaction rate. It's very difficult. Um, but uh, rather, is if you want to do a combustion guys, you want to change the fuel, you want to change the mixture, and you want to change the mechanism. So you don't want to touch this kind of uh, a, uh, ZD plus gain to change all the reaction rate. It's very difficult. So the simple way to do it is that uh, is to couple this ZD plus gain with a chemical. So all the combustion reactions, you only need to change in chemical. So therefore, the plasma chemistry, is, you let the Bosic to handle it. And then that makes you great fle flexibility to adding a different reactions, change different fuels in the combustion process. So we'll show you how to do it. I think that uh, in the uh, plus gain, you basically ZD plus gain, you basically solve that the plasma a, uh, reaction, you solve that the gas phase, electron, and the chemical a energy deposition. And then you, in the chemical process, you basically integrate that the, uh, a, uh, the process with constant enthalpy or, or in constant volume. So you can couple this. But how do you couple this? And if you solve this and then and wait for this thing, let's say you solve this in 100 nanoseconds, 
and you pass the results to this, that means that uh, this reaction is not partici participating in that reaction. But that's not good, right? So what if you have AC discharge? Then it will be difficult. You want to solve them at the same time. So at that time, and then we start to do this way, how to couple in that ZD plus gain? You basically solve that first, you take an integration. Uh, this is at the integration of density and the temperature. You first you solve a uh, combustion. And using the combustion result to substitute that result, and you solve plasma. And then you update it at one time step. So you solve everyone at the half time step, and then you feed back to the, to the other one. So it's just like that when you do CFD, you have a diffusion term, you have reaction term. What do you do? You solve the diffusion first, and give the result to reaction, and then, and then feed back again. So then eventually you update the, the system reaction. So if you want to couple ZD plus gain with chemical, you do the same thing. You, uh, you find a temporary result from combustion, and put the temporary result into the uh, ZD plus gain, and then you update that the final result at that time step. By doing this, that the, uh, the modeling becomes very flexible. So you can uh, change all the fuel and the combustion chemistry in the chemical process without touching any kind of uh, the plus gain uh, yeah, database or software. I'll show you an example that uh, how this thing is interesting to look at the physics. So in the, my laboratory, we try to uh, develop a coupling a plasma discharge to take advantage of the, the different the cross-section area dependence on electron energy. For example, in this is that the nanosecond discharge, they can generate the high energy electrons, and, but very short pulse. But after that, I try to introduce a very low energy DC, direct current uh, discharge, to, man, to make the electron energy very low, just around, let's say, one electron volt, to excite the molecule I want. For example, to excite that the singlet oxygen. Because in this stage, electron energy is so strong, they don't generate any singlet oxygen. But if you want to generate a singlet oxygen to control that reforming process, and you want to have a low energy, which can be maintained by DC. So let's do this nanosecond DC and nanosecond DC. I change that the electrical field strength in this DC, and I change the repetition rate. How can I control combustion? Do I see? Singular oxygen play a big deal in combustion? Do I see vibrational methane play a big deal in ignition process? If I do, that means that there is a potential to change the discharge by using two different kinds of high energy and low energy combination to control the plasma process. So this is basically can be modeled easily with this a, uh, a combination of ZD plus gain with chemical. So this is at the zero dimensional. I plan to plant its charge, it's homogeneous. And then square wave of the uh, electrical field, you have a nanosecond. And you have a DC, nanosecond, and a DC. In the DC, you can put a 1,000, 5,000, 10,000, 20,000. You try to mimic that in the DC and uh, by adding different voltage. And uh, how, what is that the species produced? So in the modeling conditions, you can see that uh, uh, right now we are doing HP Mac with a kinetic mechanism for C1 to C2 fuel, and uh, we have 541 species, and uh, the pressure is 60 tall, and the temperature and uh, all this uh, physical conditions. Right now we are doing is methane stoichiometric with uh, oxygen with 75% uh, of helium. We want to see what is the difference. This is that the figure basically showing you electron number density. The first pulse is that the nanosecond pulses. And then the second of four different curves are the curves of the DC with different electrical field strengths. So what you can see from here, by changing that the, uh, a, the DC electrical field, I can control the electron number density. I can control electron number density decay time. So know what? OK, so if you do this in numerical simulation, and uh, this is at the uh, a PPMs of vibrational methane. You can see from 1 thousand to 20 thousand, non-monotonically that the vibrational methane depends on the electrical field. So therefore, the 5 thousand, probably the most optimum a electrical field in the DC period to maximize that the methane vibrational state. 
So if we want to try to control some kind of a combustion process or reforming process, you need badly about the vibrational methane. This is something you can do with a nanosecond pulse and then followed by 5,000 uh, DC plus multi charge. That increased dramatically that the methane vibrational states. You can see from here too. And uh, this is another figure to see that the vibrational oxygen, you can manipulate it with 5,000 as well. And then here is that the singular oxygen. You know, I said singular oxygen, you need one electron volt to excite it. So here you can see that uh, at 5,000, the singular oxygen is still low. But if it's 10,000, you can see that you can produce a lot of uh, a singular oxygen, 30,000 uh, 30, ppm. Lots of singular oxygen can be reproduced using the combination of a nanosecond with a DC, with 10,000. And if you lots of a vibrational methane can be produced with 5,000. So this simulation gives you said you have the potential to change the plasma design and to control what species you want to produce and then to do the control that the uh, combustion or a reforming process. And this is that the comparison of reaction rates. As you can see from here, that uh, by using uh, here, somewhere here that uh, you can see vibrational state, if we have vibrational excited oxygen, you can see that this reaction rate, H plus vibrational reaction rate, is higher than the ground state, much higher than the ground state. And then by the uh, same thing here, by using the methane vibrational state, you can see the methane with OH reactions is much higher uh, than the ground state as well. So this uh, modeling is suggesting that if we control that the uh, plasma discharge form, not only you can create that the different uh, product of vibrationally excited and electronically excited, but also this vibrationally and electronic excited species can manipulate that the reaction pathways, right? So this is that clearly you show. But experimentally, is that real? I don't know. I mean, that we have to design some kind of thing, experimental thing, to see whether this is correct. But first, first order, and you do a modeling that guide you what kind of experiment you want to design. So, and then what if I want to do one-dimensional modeling accurate? And uh, here, that is a modeling, and uh, using that the uh, a uh, neuron young with a Vigo young at uh, Penn State, uh, not Penn State, with Georgia Tech, and then they are using this a uh, solving a, this a uh, a uh, Poisson equations, and with a, uh, a electron energy density, and a electron number density, and fluid equations with coupling about force, and then heat, and using the Bosic and to get the reaction rate, and then coupling with the solver, they can do modeling. They do the multi-scale modeling. Multi-scale means what? And uh, they, I will show you what is the multi -scale. Because you indeed, because the plasma uh, time is very short, and the combustion time is very long. If you match all the computation with one time step, it's very difficult to take it forever to solve. And if you take a lot of time that you miss the plasma, you, you take a small time set, you, you forever. So we, you need a, a multi-time scale method. I try to show you what is a multi-time scale method. And uh, multi-time scale method, and I think uh, a, a Vig, Vigor Young, Professor Young used that method we developed at Princeton a few years ago. The idea is that, for example, if you're looking at a uh, inhibitor combustion ignition process, uh, initially, let's say time equal to 0.1 millisecond, and you can see that the time scale, this is the number of species, this is a time scale lock. And most of the species are s lower time scale, but as the ignition going on, and you can become the shorter and the shorter time scale, the time scale is moving towards the shorter time scale because ignition is triggered. And how do you model this process? If you model this process, and uh, using ODE solver, it takes forever because ODE solver is proportional to the cubic of species number. Okay, if you have a large number, you are dead. And uh, uh, so that time that the, if you try to con compute that the time scale of, of each eigenvalue, that takes time because you have to form a Jacobian to find out what is eigenvalue. That's impossible. For me, I was thinking that there's a simple way 
to do estimate what is the time scale of each species. Take a derivative, this is that dy dt is the reaction rate of the species. You have to have it in computation. And take a derivative of the species, you find the, this is the approximate time scale of that species. If that species is very short, you don't need to calculate it very long. You just only need to carry five time step, and that concentration is stable. And you pass that concentration to the next group. So in every computation, you divide the system into many, many times, many, many order of magnitude. You group them in 10 times orders, from one second to 10 to minus 10, for example, or shorter. You solve this fast ones for step and convert it. You pass that concentration to the next one, next one, next one. So anything you do, you very short time step for this species, and then large, 10 times larger, 10 times larger and you can dramatically accelerate the computation time. So how, how much you can do a computation time? This is important when you deal, not only deal with plasma, but also deal with the, a uh, detailed chemistry. So you can do this kind of a, 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 a multi-time scale method, is what we do. And uh, you can compare that the uh, reaction uh, ignition problem for N-heptan, for example, and decan You can see that the multi-time scale method give you accurate prediction of temperature, radicals, a stable species compared to ODE solver, uh, multi-time scale, hybrid multi-time scale method. And also for ignition delay, depending on, you can predict the accurate as well. And uh, so this is all ignition problem, but you can also predict flame propagation as well. We can, you can look at some papers. So I try to show you that uh, how big that the multi-time scale method can contribute. So we have a model. Uh, that model is a uh, real fuel. We have 425 species. And then we using that the, this is that the uh, uh, computation time, CPU time. This is that the uh, CPU time used for chemistry. This is the CPU time used for transport. I mean the diffusion and convection. You can see that uh, the most of the CPU time used is actually to integrate the chemistry. By introducing this kind of uh, a uh, multi-time scale method, you can see that uh, I don't change that the convection and diffusion, but my time required for chemistry integration is dramatically shortened. By introducing on the fly a dynamic model reduction, I can further reduce that the uh, chemistry integration time because the system getting smaller due to the on the fly model reduction. But I increase the cost of the model reduction process. That does not give me any benefit, okay? And, uh, and then by introducing that the, uh, a new method they call a correlated, a uh, dynamic adaptive chemistry method. That means that for any reaction, you define a phase, for, phase space. If that the species and temperature is close in the same phase space, you do not have to reduce anymore. You just pass that the previously reduced reaction model to that. You don't have to do the redu reduction. So they basically, that, uh, you define a phase space, and you find the correlation in time, and you find the correlation in space, and then you pass that the reduced mechanism around. And that dramatically reduces your computation time. So how do I define the criteria? What is the phase space? The phase space that is a major species you need, it, and then key, two key radicals, OH, for meta, uh, OH and HO2. So once you do this, I tell you what it is. So here that is the ODE solver, and here is that a multi-time scale method. Here is a multi-time scale method with dynamic adaptive chemistry, and here you can see that by using this correlated dynamic adaptive chemistry, Kodak method, and then the time required for, for on-the-fly model reduction is almost negligible, even for the chemistry that have 400 species. So nowadays, we don't care how big the model is. As long as I can do on the fly model reduction, that reduction time is far less. And that chemistry integration time even less than this, what? Convection and diffusion time. So my major priority is not to reduce the time for chemistry. It is to reduce time to compute that the transport process, the diffusivity, viscosity, and conductivity. How do I do that? We can, using the same method called correlated adaptive transport, 
we can do accelerate uh, the, the transport properties by calculating that the divisivity and then by 200 times with a less than 1% of uncertainty. So that, what is that we, we try to do? I say that you can see here, all the things is try to divisivity and the uh, measurement. So if we can introduce, remove this part, you can dramatically accelerate the computation. And then this is that the codec T, um, I mean the dynamic a adaptive transport, chemistry and transport. And you can see the model is very accurate. It will produce everything by using this method. And then you can see the computation efficiency. I, I don't want to show you, time is limited. Um, uh, let me forward this one. I try to show you the result. The result is like that. Here that I have a large uh, time to compute that the transport properties. Question. Correct. So how well do these, even if these models are fast with all these techniques, how well do they, how well do they work compared to experiments? How well do they work for the experiment? So my experience is that uh, for small species like ethylene, and they do reasonably well, and uh, except that the intermediate species. For larger alkanes, they poorly perform. But that is not something we cannot solve. As, lo as long as you have experimental data, you can always optimize the, the major reaction pathways. Okay? So I think that right now, combustion right now, is, to my understanding, combustion right now is really exciting because the kinetics and then diagnostics and then the numerical modeling all coming together. Right? You see that in simulation, I'm not afraid about large mechanism anymore. I mean that in kinetic model, today, many people can give you automatically generated mechanism. Right? You have a lot of kilohertz diagnostics, everything coming together, give you the experiment data. It's a good time for combustion to using the knowledge for innovation. If we cannot, the, the field is gone. Okay? I think that with this much knowledge understood, if we cannot design a new engine, a new whatever, that it will be a big challenge for this field. I think for this field is that good in time right now, we develop a lot of tools. This tool has to be used to revolutionize our energy conversion system. If we stop innovation, then we will be replaced by something else. Okay, that is my personal understanding. So, is that okay, answer your question? Okay, good. So, that right now that is really that the, uh, a, uh, the simulation, but you can see that remove the transport properties, the model reduction, and then the uh, chemistry integration becomes the dominant again. Then we have to find another method to do it. So that's what we try to develop the, uh, the, uh, the using the G scheme and the multi-time scale method. You can see this is CPU time. VOD proportional to cubic of the number of species. The G scheme also proportional to the cubic. A multi-time scale method is only linearly proportional to species. And then we can use this, the uh, combination of G scheme and then multi-time scale method to do a broad range about efficient computation modeling in the future. So if a, a computation model is linearly proportional to the species, you really are not scared to the model anymore, right? 100 species or 200 species, you only one day or two day problem, right? So that is a, a, uh, how advanced in the last five years combustion has been achieved in model generation, model validation, computation efficiency, and the experiment. So, I show you that the two-dimensional uh, fluid model, and uh, for example, in Eco Central Paris, and the Anna, I think that uh, her name is uh, the uh, uh, Borden, is doing this fluid model, basically using a traditional fluid mechanics by adding this kind of uh, transport properties and source term and into the fluid model. We try to solve that a, uh, a discharge between anode and a cathode, and. Uh, a, uh, using a, uh, a nanosecond discharge. So you can see that this is at the uh, time evolution of a, at 4 nanosecond, at 4.3 nanosecond, uh, in terms of a, a, a distribution of electrical field, a distribution of a number of electron density. 
as you can see in the beginning, you can see that uh, the strong electric field is formed near the, the anode, and, uh, and the electrons is flying through the cathode to the anode, and there's a, uh, a electrons generated through the ion bombardment near the, near the anode. So at the time of 4.3, you can see that the electron number density, the, uh, the two, the cathode wave and the, the anode wave, they combine together and generate a concentrate a, a electric field somewhere here. So this fluid model is very simplified, but it can give you a qualitative understanding what is going on of plasma discharge in a multidimensional a, uh, domain. So what is the finding? The finding that they can model that the time independent, of, of course, the solution is very short, only 100 nanoseconds. About the vibrational, uh, vibration, uh, not vibration, electronic excitation of nitrogen and uh, O and uh, O1, O1D uh, subformation. So you can see that uh, in the plasma process, the uh, nitrogen excited B C states is highly populated, and this causing that the B state and the C state reaction with oxygen, they form a uh, radicals and they generate this much heating effect. This is called fast heating caused by this oxygen and vibrational nitrogen. So this is, is again confirm that uh, a, uh, this a, uh, electronically excited nitrogen and also a uh, electron impact, a, dis a dissociation of oxygen play a big role and in plasma assisted combustion. And also that fast heating uh, play a role in change the local temperature and accelerate that the, uh, 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 the kinetic process. That's all I want to talk and, uh, today uh, about that, uh, what is that the uh, a, um, a plasma assisted combustion. I think that through these three days, you probably have a good picture what is a uh, plasma assisted combustion, uh, what has been done, what are the problems, what need to be done in the future. I think that they need to be done in the future to integrate the knowledge we have, the tools we have for innovation. We have to innovate, okay? If the engine is keeping adding 35%, 40% efficiency, you are done, right? You only become an engineer. You will not create a new field anymore. Every field, when they grow in, they need some kind of driver, right? Internal combustion engine, when they invent it, they drive the uh, industry revolution, right? So computer, the same thing. What is the next thing? Next thing we can do to innovate rapid, for example, uh, rotational detonation, for example. Right now, a lot of hot, right? There could be, if that will transform that the energy conver conversion, and then the lean burn technology, for example, for, a, uh, for advanced engines will be come to play. You know, hybrid vehicles, all this kind of stuff. We have to say advanced turbines, for example, and then we generate some new materials. Can the turbine energy dramatically increase? The NOx emission become a problem. How do we solve it? So all these kind of things, we need a kind of innovative ideas. And using the knowledge we have, the tools we have to do it. And um, do not close your eyes and then just doing the things in front of you. Right? We need to be deep. We need to solve the problem. But more big problems is that the innovative ideas. Uh, so we have a few minutes with the talk. And I'll probably have one slide in talk about perspective of a uh, plasma assisted combustion. So really, I think that uh, a plasma provide a wonderful opportunity to control a combustion process because that the energetic process of electrons and then excited species. That's for sure. Okay. I think that is the number one challenge in terms of practical is how do we generate a uh, volumetric discharge at high pressure, okay? So that is that if we can generate at the 10 atmosphere pressure or engine condition, if we can generate a discharge, let's say a uniform discharge, nearly uniform discharge at a, a few centimeters, which is bigger than the critical radius of ignition, that is a great invention to solve the engine ignition problem, 
Okay, that is one thing. And then the second thing that uh, in terms of science is that there's a huge gap in understanding about the energy transfer from electronic to vibrational to transition. So many of these processes we don't understand. There are a few experiments are designed and to enter this elementary process. Right? That's what um, I, I, uh, I think the energy transfer problem from science point of view. Um, and three, the challenge is, is multi-scale modeling process, tools. So we need to develop a, uh, predictive, a, mod, a predictive computational model. So using that, the, uh, the data available and then to see whether we can, how do we can understand the multidimensional process, right? Has a qualitative understanding. So in order to do that, I think that the theorists, particularly, and the experimentists, they understand what is that the reaction pathway, non-equilibrium reaction pathway, non-equilibrium reaction pathway. And I think that combustion knowledge about the ab initial quantum chemistry is so advanced that they can be applied to these areas. Okay. I was talking to Stephen Clipson, he's sitting next to me, he said, I may, I may lose my job because DOE is not funding this uh, um, combustion problem. And I said that there are so many other areas you should thrive and you should make a great impact using the knowledge you have. For example, chemical vapor deposition for materials, right? and Air Force right now to funding a big project to say they're using a plasma to make a new materials because plasma can break down anything, create a new element, uh, but not new element, sorry, so. <laughs> create all kinds of atoms. You can assemble it together to make some materials you normally cannot do it. What is that process? And how do we know that the elementary process, the elementary rate in that plasma environment? that Stephen can play a big role, and uh, you can play a big role there. And uh, Air Force also calling for proposal, and I'm trying to put a proposal together, is that how do we use in piezoelectrical materials to generate, to, to design a smart propellant? For example, piezoelectrical materials, for example, you can use in electrical field to control the piezo piezoelectrical field general strain, right? That strain can determine where that the propellant can detonate. Right? Or that the impact of the propellant can generate a charge through the piezoelectric materials. That electrical material can generate a discharge ignite that detonation too. So what is the physical process of this piezoelectric the electrical field generated in piezoelectric field in the act with the propellant? What is the reaction? I don't think anybody really had an understanding. We were on a teleconference with, with the best of brains in this country. We're talking about it. Nobody gets it, understand what it is. Don't you think that is the innovation? I think yes. That is the knowledge we really know. That is highly dependent on how it, what is the electric field on the kinetics on propellant? How does the grain interface change this uh, process, right? I think they, uh, a group of uh, researchers in Purdue, particularly Stephen Song, they did this kind of a piezoelectric materials, uh, put in the propellant and, they, uh, and then bang, hammer it and see that, oh, there's a piezoelectric has some effect. But the question is, what is the effect? Where does it come from, right? And what is that the electric field and or strain compared? So this, I think that is so many interesting areas. And then I think this is something I, I really appreciate you coming to this class because this class is not some traditional combustion. It's giving you to a, a little bit of step outside the combustion area. But that step can be go to any area you want to, right? Can be good. So, uh, so I think that is a, a uh, this is the four things I think that is, a, 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 is important. And from application side is that a lot of uh, plasma uh, chemistry guys are going to the bio areas to do plasma medicine, right? I have a postdoc uh, welcome uh, from Germany, and they're using this uh, uh, plasma to generate active species like uh, hydrogen peroxide or uh, NO2, try to uh, kill cancer cells, kill bacteria, right? 
So that is another area branched out from the plasma chemistry, right? They're doing plasma fertilizer and uh, plasma materials, all this kind of thing. Recently, plasma catalyst, plasma materials synthesis, for example, CO2 and water or methane reforming into fuel or syn gas, these are all areas and they're coming up today. And plasma biomass, for example, clean up, plasma water clean up. Don't you think that the, uh, a, uh, the, uh, this, this are the, these new areas, they require people to get in using the knowledge you learned before. So what I try to see that from my personal perspective, uh, the four areas plus a bunch of new application areas and it will be the gap of the future and need people to contribute to that, that field. And uh, so that's my personal opinion. So anybody else want to uh, comment and uh, ask questions particularly and uh, uh, for the po staff and postdocs and then you have more experience in this area and uh, what a plasma can do or what is that they need to be understood. What are the new applications also? Right. Uh, you've talked extensively about the uh, use of plasma for uh, gas-based reaction, especially in the ignition process, when you go to lean combustion. I'm just wondering, does in, in cold combustion as well, we have the problem of flip boarding issues, where you don't have, you can't get the particles to ignite. Uh, can we apply plasma to like viscous based multi-phase system as well? Yeah, I think that the, uh, uh, in, when I was a graduate student, actually, in, in China, the people were using plasma torch. Uh, to ignite the, the coal uh, as an igniter because that, that's a probably a very effective way to generate heating and gasification at a high temperature. Yes, there are people doing that. Yeah, but I also am very interested in saying that particularly you know, if for coal powders, right? If you have a powders, this powder is very small. If you put a plasma, and electrons stick to the surface of the powders. You put an electrical field, and the heating is really focused on the surface of the powders, right? Yeah. Uh, I think this is a very interesting thing. The same thing as in making uh, nanomaterials. In, you know, people making nanomaterials of nanosilicon, right, for uh, uh, car batteries. They, what they do, they use in silane, and then using a uh, plasma to break down the silane and generate the uh, particles, right? Once the particles generate, the electrons stick to the particles, and then they, they, they interact with the electrical field. It generates superheating on the surface, and then synthesize that the materials. I think this is a very interesting process. Yeah. yeah. Uh, going back to the, to the first day, when you talked about the, the idea that G is trying to use plasma for uh, doing the lean bond combustion. Uh, so how would they do that? Like, the, the gas turbine itself is Okay, I, I show you idea for free, and, and uh, um, so you look at the, uh, anybody worked at GE Global before? No one. So their igniter, you, can, you probably put a two to three igniter into the, the gas turbine in case that one fail, the other one work, right? But now that because of the NOx emissions and they have to burn in very lean things, Sometimes they cannot ignite it. And the only thing they do is they raise the energy. And as they raise energy, and the, the uh, spark plug, the heat loss is so big, and then eventually they, they broke the thing. I have to frequently replace it. That become a big problem. So what do they do that is very interesting? That they have a, this kind of a plasma, a little bit of cavity like that. This is that the, uh, the, uh, the electrode. And this is that the, uh, the insulation. So this is that the, uh, the symmetry. If you look at the symmetry, there is the same thing. Is that this half, this will be. Uh, so this is the anode. This is the, the, this is the anode, this is the cathode, right? So w they put a, a, a uh, electrical field into it, like this one. Right now, that they probably put something like that. See what I'm saying? And then what they do, they give this pulse into it, and this will generate a probably arc between this uh, uh, cathode and anode and generate an enormous heat release, right? 
This enormous Halley release generates a shock wave propagating outside and generates some kind of spark like that. Okay? This spark is too small to ignite. That's the mixture, the mixture. And the dimension of this spark of delta is smaller than the critical radius needed to be to ignite the mixture when the mixture is very lean or at low pressure for relight. This spark has never been changed probably in the last decades, but nobody cares about it until that the, uh, the recent energy efficiency or emission become a problem. So the question that is that how do we change this, uh, the size? Well, in addition to the size, you can change that the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the plasma or change the energy forms. For example, if this energy is like that, you can put the energy like uh, this kind of shape, for example, decay. You, know, you can put the energy divided into a different way, optimize. That is a, the energy form to change the discharge. Because the energy is different, is the time scale different, the shock wave will be different, the strength will be different, the change of the volume will be different. And also the geometry has to be op optimized in order to generate something like that. So, and I told them that you have designed something like this. And then, and then they right, try to start to modif do numerical modeling. How to model with this discharge, we can get a large volume of ignition. So I think that this uh, idea criteria, and plus that the uh, energy design and geometry, and with a multidimensional CFD, eventually we'll get there. I think this is the area how that the, the knowledge will transfer for, for innovation about the different uh, uh, plasma discharge. Okay. Any other questions? What is the future of uh, fluid control? Fluid you, you think well, flameless control? No, flow control. Oh, flow control. I think that uh, my personal knowledge is that uh, I'm not a believer of flow control, particularly for high speed. But Air Force has enormous driver to drive this direction using a small a, uh, plasma to control boundary layer. The question is that, yes, it can control for a certain, air, certain flight range. But aircraft has to be flying a broad radiance number, a broad con weather conditions, right? A plasma discharge may discharge, may not discharge, depending on whether you have icing or whether some other things, right? I think that the, that area, right, right now, that the, the still has a group and in that area of plasma con flow control using uh, plasma, and, but it's, mostly it's curiosity, I would say that. Cu curiosity. There's some effectiveness in certain uh, wave number, but I think that it uh, uh, takes a longer time to happen. That's my, I, don't, I wouldn't say that it not, will not happen, but it takes a longer time to happen. And I, I think that because that is a uh, plus flow control is like a arm race, right? It's like a, it, you have to have the momenta to win the bigger momenta, right? And like a ignition, a few radicals will just dominate everything, isn't it? So I think the chemistry way is the best way to use plasma to do something. Yeah, using the, the plasma generated momenta, I need to win or some kind of, a, we have much better mechanical way to do that. So what about the reentry? Re Okay, reentry is a different plasma though. So when you have a high speed, a Mach number 20 something plus in coming to the air, so that second engine temperature probably 10,000 Kelvin, mostly probably close to equilibrium plasma. So there, that non-equilibrium dissociation, recombination of this process, radiation probably is important. It's not really that relative to ignition or something, mostly heat transfer problem, reentry problem. Anything else? Right, presumably, plasma can help fuel cells in terms of the enhancement of proton exchange. Wow, that is some, something I, um, I'm, I'm not familiar with. It's okay, plasma can, in, in terms of, uh, uh, you're talking about hydrogen fuel cell? You said, uh, so you try to enhance that the, uh, proton transport of hydrogen? Mm. So fuel cell is try to generate electricity, right? I think that depends on the penalty. 
uh, how much that the, uh, your plasma, uh, I mean, I would don't say plasma, I would say the electrical field and uh, to help the, the transport. I think, the, yes, it will help that the uh, ion transport, but if you're using plasma, I think it likely will damage your, 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 your membrane. The electron energy high and you break down your membrane, right? Eventually, your membrane will be damaged, right? And the plasma can generate some kind of a, a, um, acid as well in the water, particularly. So that may not be good for, for memory. I don't know. I mean, that you can always imagine it. Don't believe what, everything I say, OK? I just give you what uh, I think. I think that for acoustic time scale, I think that mostly we're looking at acoustic instability and uh, in engines, right? It's about 10,000 hertz, right? 10,000 hertz is 10 to minus 4, right? In most of talking about the combustion, the time scale we want to remove is physically we are not interested in is 10 to minus 11, 10 to minus 12, 10 to minus 9, 10 to minus. As long as he can do a multi time scale method to bring you to 10 to minus 12, to 10 to minus 7, I'm happy with it, right? It means that is, uh, my physical interest is at 0.1 microsecond. Anything above 0.1, sec 0.1 microsecond is my physical interest. And that's my base time step. Anything below that, I want to use a multi-time scale because that information I don't need anymore. So that is the physics. I don't think that it will hurt your acoustic at all. Yeah, we basically model this. Uh, detonation initiation or uh, acoustic information using this multi time scale method. So no problem at all. Okay. Yeah. I guess I was wondering if you can incorporate not in a two in a two stage, but can you put it in only one stage that you can put both acoustics and the chemistry in the same multi time scale method? Is it applicable? Because I, I suppose you were saying that you try to um, put the combustion and some physics in the multi-time scale and put acoustics in another scale. Yeah, I think that the, uh, if you are interested in acoustics, I think that the time scale should be uh, that the limiting time scale, you want to do multi-time scale, multi scale method. Because that is the physical interest. You should not cut that time scale, right? Mm -hmm. So that time scale is the base time, time scale. And the multi-time scale method is doing something bit, bit inside the base time scale. So that is, it does not affect your physical the uh, process, right? Anything else? I see some people is very tired. If not, and with that, I uh, close this uh, lecture and thank you very much for coming to this lecture. I hope you learned something. Thank you very much. <laughs>